right, you guys should know already where you're going to turn. You guys were great. You know that it's Hosea, Joel, and then Amos. Who comes after Amos? Obadiah. Nailed it. Man, a couple of you know this stuff. That's great. Absolutely great. <laughs> Hosea had a great introduction to his, his writing, his, his prophecies. Joel doesn't. Joel was a prophet. That's pretty much all we know about him. We know who his dad was. You know, that's uh, the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. And that's all we got. And that's okay. Because whether we know a lot about him or really not much at all about him, we know that what he said was inspired by God and it spoke to his generation and it speaks to our generation. And sometimes that's all we really need to know. We don't know when it was written. Hosea had a lot of indicators of time, what kings he prophesied during. Joel doesn't give us any of that. And there's no indicator really uh, to, to nail it down very precisely within his prophecy. There are no dates, no mention of any particular kings uh, to date it to. But it's interesting that there is no mention of any king at all which is kind of odd. When he's calling the nation to repentance, he doesn't mention a king. But he does mention priests. He mentions elders. He mentions a temple. So the most likely time this was written was sometime very early in uh, their time of exile, but after, just after the temple had been rebuilt. It couldn't have been during the time the temple had been destroyed because they're called to go to the temple to fast and to pray. But there's no king, so likely it's after they've been exiled. There's no king ruling. That's about the closest we can get. Now, Joel gets around a lot, even though we don't know much about him. In the New Testament, he's not referenced nearly as much as Hosea. But when we look at Joel in the New Testament, we see two places, Acts chapter 2 and Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 13. And they both quote the same passage toward the end of Joel chapter 2 uh, about the, the Lord pouring out his spirit in the last days and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that Paul takes that at the end of Romans and applies it directly to who is the Lord that they're calling on? Jesus. Where here, they would see it as, you know, the, the Jews would view this as the, the one true God. Uh, well, now in Romans, Paul is saying, yeah, that one true God that they worshiped all along is Jesus. That's who he is. An incredible statement of Jesus's divinity. But more interesting for Joel is where we see Joel in the 12. Among the rest of the 12, there are 13 uh, quotes, if you will, where either Joel is quoting another prophet or one of these other prophets is quoting Joel. 13 times over those six prophets, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Obadiah, and Zechariah, Joel is referred to often as the anchor of the 12 because of how much he's referenced among the other 12. And we don't always know who's quoting who because if they both say the same thing, um, we don't necessarily know who said it first. Other than there's one place that he absolutely quotes I, Obadiah. So we know Obadiah was first. Um, but it, it's amazing to see how connected these 12 prophets are in their writings, in their themes, in all the stuff they're doing. Joel is also in the South. You guys didn't know this. But Joel could properly be called the prophet of the South. You didn't know that, did you? No. Did anybody pick up on the verse that might imply that? See, this didn't stand out because you guys are from, you're from the South. So you don't think about this. See, I, I'm not from the South. I didn't know I was from the North until I married into the South. <laughs> and then I found out. I just thought I lived in the United States. I was wrong. But because I come from what I would say is the correct side of the Mason-Dixon line, <laughs> you're, you're going to like where this goes. You're going to like this. Joel chapter 2, verse 20, and tell me you will never think of this verse the same again. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea, the stench and the foul smell of him will rise. See, you guys didn't even know 
Joel was from the South and wanted to see the Northerners go away. But I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying. (laughs) But every time I've read that, I've thought of it since I've married into the South. How many of you thought Joel was easier to read and understand than Hosea? No? Some yes? How many thought it was more difficult? Wow, kind of an even split. Some of you thought it was easier, some more difficult. It was definitely a lot less to read. Uh, Only three chapters instead of 14. But Joel, what's the main thing of, of Joel? Hosea was known because of his marriage. And that's what sort of drove everything in Hosea. What drove everything in Joel? You couldn't tell by the title. The locust. Everything there is grounded in this locust plague. And it is a a brutal locust plague. If you're familiar with locusts, they, uh, they're kind of like grasshoppers in the sense that they, they fly around and they eat stuff, but they come in these massive swarms that can stretch for like hundreds of square miles. I mean, just huge. And they're very common in that part of the world that they happen. But this time, if you look at chapter one, verse four, there were four waves of locusts that came through, one after the other after the other, and they, they destroyed everything. He says, what the cutting locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. And those are just, uh, not that any one type of locust was different than the other, but it's just referencing four different waves that came in succession and obliterated the land. Completely did that. And that was a judgment from God. God was judging them for their rebellion and their their faithlessness to him uh, and and the things of the nation. And so the people here, Joel is not predicting this. He's reminding them of this, that, hey, this happened, so you better repent because if you don't repent and turn back to the Lord with all of your heart, worse judgment is going to come. And that's a significant warning, so they needed to repent. In reality, we know it's based on the locust, but if you wanted to summarize Joel, it's a call to repentance. He's calling the people to repent. Because of what God has done and what God is going to do, they need to repent. But the neat thing about Joel is the people did repent. And they turned to God and he, he, he healed them, he forgave them, he restored things to them, and he promised an even greater restoration in the end. So some really good things with Joel. But we're going to start with this call to repentance. Now, uh, Joel calls for not just people to say, I'm sorry. He doesn't just call to feel bad about something. He calls to a formal public repentance. You know, sometimes we, we get into this place where we, we want to privatize everything about us and Jesus. We think, well, my decision is between me and Jesus, and when I'm judged, it's going to be me and Jesus. Even though the Bible says we're all going to stand before the throne, it never says you're going to stand there by yourself. Did you know that? It never says judgment is a one-on-one thing. He talks about separating groups of people and judging with them and dealing with them, but this this Western notion of it's just me and Jesus, we really don't find that in scripture quite the same way. There's a corporate reality to who we are as God's people. And he doesn't just say each one of you needs to repent. Look Look at the call to repentance in Joel chapter one. He says, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth. O oh, ministers of my God. Sackcloth was like a, a very coarse, rough garment to put on. They would take off their regular clothes and put on this because it was, it was irritating and it would hurt and bother you. And it was to intensify the mourning and the awareness of the sin and the things that they're grieving over. He says, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land, all of them, to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. In other words, you need to do something. Not just take a moment of silent prayer and say, God, forgive me, but you've got to take public action. We're all coming together. We're all calling out to God and saying, God, forgive us. 
And this isn't the only place. Later on, he, he issues a similar call in chapter two. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. And think about this. In Israel, if you were newly married, you didn't have to go to war. You didn't have to do anything for a year after your wedding. God said, take a year and, and be united, become one, and don't worry about anything else. But yet here he's saying, I don't care if you're newly married. You get here and you repent. You call out to God. No one is exempt. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. He's getting serious, okay? Because we like to think that, well, if I'm gonna repent for my sin, you know, we, we kind of eschew the idea that we have to uh, confess to somebody as the Catholic model, they have to go to confession. Um, and so we say, well, no, it's just me and Jesus. If I just confess, we're, you know, real quiet, real private. Um, no, there, sometimes there's a need for a public display of repentance, and saying, God, I'm truly humbling myself before you and I'm getting my act together with you and I'm getting things right between me and you. No specific sins are mentioned in Joel's letter or his prophecy. You know, he never mentions idolatry, never mentions rebellion, never injustice or not caring for orphans and widows, all the things that are very common in the prophets he mentions nothing specific. And sometimes I think that may even be uh, more significant because we're all, we, we all sin. We all fail. We all fall. None of us are perfect. We can't take Joel's letter and say, well, I didn't do what they did. He doesn't say anything. He just says, get your heart right and repent of the sin that's there. And so while we can't just go through the motions, motions are a part of it. You know, the, these things that we refer to as, um, Jesus referred to them as uh, practicing righteousness. Things like giving, praying, fasting. Jesus says, when you're practicing your righteousness, don't do it like the Pharisees do. So while we can't just go through the motions like the Pharisees, we, we can't forget about the motions either. That's a part of the way Jesus has called us to do life in him. But we have to embrace the mourning, not numb it. We have to embrace the pain, embrace the sorrow, embrace the suffering, embrace the reality of what God is doing in our hearts and not numb it. Uh, we are so afraid of suffering and hardship that we try to numb everything in our culture. We can't do that. I mean, seriously, think about the sackcloth they would wear. I mean, we think, why in the world would you put on something purposefully that hurts? That just doesn't make any sense but it's because they're really entering into the reality of what God is doing inside of them and allowing that to work because we, we numb it. We numb it through all sorts of different ways. We numb it with medication. If I'm having a hard time, I get, I get medication to deal with that. Or I check out and I just turn on the TV and I, I entertain myself until I'm so tired, I just turn it off and fall asleep but I'm going to numb it. I'm going to tune it out. I'm going to ignore it. I'm just going to forget about it and pretend like it's not there. But if you don't deal with things, they don't go away. You just shove it further back or deeper down and all these things and, and eventually it erupts because it hasn't been dealt with. And that's why we see things like sackcloth, like putting ashes on their head, like coming to the temple to repent. They did these things as a, a, a public display, a, a motion, an action that shows it's not just my words, but I'm serious, God. I'm doing something in this. But that implies a genuine repentance, an actual change of heart, a change of mind. God doesn't just want our motions, but he doesn't say forget them either. He wants our heart. Okay, look, look what Joel says. He says, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. 
Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. In other words, just because there's something coming, God will stop and forgive at the drop of a hat. Because that's what he wants to do. He's longing to do it if we would just repent of our sin and call out to God and let him deal with us. But you notice he, he just calls them to, to rend their garments and put on the sackcloth. And now he says, rend your hearts, not your garments. He, he's not saying don't do the things. He's saying, let it be real. There has to be a real heart. It gets to the heart of the matter because the heart is the matter. Okay, the heart is what God is after. Just like Hosea's, he wants uh, mercy and love, not sacrifice. Jesus wants your heart. He wants you to truly humble yourself before him and to be different. See, we can't just say we're sorry and then keep doing the same thing. You know, you, you can't. We do that. We get in these ruts where we just, we say we're sorry. Sometimes maybe we even mean it, but then we just keep doing the same thing. Repentance demands change. Okay, repentance literally means to turn, to turn your heart, to turn your mind, to turn your actions, to turn your words, that we're moving this direction, now they're moving that direction. Okay, it, it's a real change of heart that has to happen. You have to change your mind about something. See, something we like to say we're sorry, and then we just keep doing the same thing. We, we don't change. You have to change. That means something has to be different. And I know that's very redundant, but we, we often say we're for change as long as everything stays the same, right? We, I mean, seriously, we, we say we want God to change us, but then we don't want anything in our life to actually be different because that means you have to get rid of things. You have to instill new things. That means it's going to hurt because there's pain with growth, with change, with loss, all those things, but they're required for us to be different because if we don't do all that, we're the same. And that means nothing happened. So the primary thing of Joel is a call to repentance. And we're going to come back to that. But he gives us two reasons. Two reasons that we should turn our hearts back towards him. Number one is a warning of judgment. See, Joel reminded them of this plague, this locust that just came through and devoured. And I'm sure they didn't really need reminded. Uh, you kind of know that when something like that happens. And you know when God brings correction into your life, you know, oh, that was God. He's trying to get my attention. But Joel tells them that that first plague was just a warning shot, right? That was God's warning shot. It was a precursor to a greater judgment that was coming if they didn't repent. How many times do we see that in our lives? God, God is warning us in his grace and in his mercy, he allows us to experience consequences of our actions so that we understand if we don't change our ways, if we don't turn our heart towards him, it gets worse. It doesn't get better on its own. And they would have understood this, right? They knew the, the locust army in chapter one, he referred to all of that with past tense terms, it happened. The army of chapter two he's talking about, and to be honest, there's uncertainty whether this is a real army or another army of locusts that's coming. Uh, we, we don't know, he's not very clear, but he's saying that something more significant, more powerful, more terrifying is coming if you don't repent with sincerity. And they understood that. In Exodus, if you remember the Exodus, the plagues that came, the locusts came right before darkness and death. As Moses was clarifying the curses of the covenant, the consequences that would come from breaking our covenant relationship with God, locusts come right before death and exile. They, they understood that locusts were kind of, okay, you're right on the brink. And then it's about to be really, really bad, if not completely over. In fact, he says, more severe punishment is coming that even prefigures the day of the Lord, which often they would think of the day of the Lord as the day he would come and just restore his people and it would all be wonderful. But they said, no, when the day of the Lord comes, it's a day of judgment and darkness and gloom and destruction because his people aren't faithful. And so they're going to experience the consequences of that. And it's a catastrophic judgment. 
In Joel chapter two, he describes it and he says, blood and fire and columns of smoke speaks of war. When wars happen, there's blood and fire and smoke as things are being burned and destroyed and the wreckage happens. It's darkness and judgment. He says the moon will go dark or the, the sun will go dark. The moon will turn to blood. The stars won't give their light. And he's, he's not trying to say and press literally that, that the moon is going to turn into blood. It, it, it's not going to turn into a big ball of liquid. He's saying this is going to be a catastrophic judgment of darkness, of wrath. It won't be good for those who have not repented. Those whose hearts are not torn to turn to the Lord, it will be terrible. The only response to a warning like this is to repent. That's what you've got to do. We have to repent when we see this. If we don't respond to his correction now, real judgment will come. And I don't want us to, to just jump into this quick thought of, well, I'm glad I'm a believer. I don't have to worry about that if I repent or not. Be cautious. Remember what we saw in Hebrews chapter 10. If we go on sinning, and this is written to believers, he says, if we go on sinning after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment. Okay? We can never treat sin lightly. The, if you want to talk about eternal security and security that we would have, if you want secure, stay close to Jesus. Amen. That's where you are secure. If you don't stay close to Jesus, you're not staying close to security because he is our security. Not something, it's him. He is our security. He is who we have to turn to. And if we don't, and if we don't stay close to him, judgment comes. Who did Joel write this to? The people that were in covenant relationship with God. Who are we? The people in covenant relationship with God have to take it seriously. But it's not just doom and gloom. There's a bright side to this. And this is where it's joyful. It's rough going into places like that, but we have to, and we have to embrace them but we get to go to other places too because there's a promise of forgiveness. And the forgiveness that we see and the restoration that we see in Joel is is beyond anything we can imagine what God will do because God will forgive you when you turn to him with all your heart. He absolutely will. There is nothing you can do that that, that takes you too far away from God's forgiveness. You can't do some sin that is so evil, God will never forgive you. You really can't. If you know Paul that wrote, you know, a, a lot of the letters of the New Testament, he was rounding up Christians and murdering them. Like that's what he did before he became a Christian. And he thought he was doing God a favor by doing it. And yet God used him tremendously. And I, I would venture to say, none of you have just rounded up Christians and taken letters to other towns so you could round up Christians and throw them in prison and kill them. So you're not as far gone as Paul was, Okay. We all fall in that boat that we can be forgiven. And while the day of the Lord is judgment for God's enemies, it's blessing and forgiveness and joy and restoration for God's people. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. He, he goes through this whole list towards the end of chapter two and into chapter three of Joel of all these things that he's gonna do uh, after this first plague of locusts came through, the people repented, God turned. It says he relented, he had pity on his people he, and he forgave them and he restored them. It said he would bring them the early and the late rains. They needed that for their crops, especially after they were just devastated by multiple plagues of locusts. He's gonna give them the rain that they need to restore the crops. He said their threshing floor is gonna be full. There would be milk in abundance. He even said that sweet wine would flow down the mountains. I mean, think of the the picture of abundance with wine just flowing down the mountain. That's joyful. Picture of the messianic age, the time of life in the kingdom. Anybody know what Jesus' first miracle was? An abundance of wine at a celebration. It's a joyful thing. And Jesus was all about it. 
And he wasn't just doing, you know, some neat trick. He was signaling that the messianic age has dawned. The abundance of wine is here and God's promises are being fulfilled in him. If you have your Bible, look at chapter two, verse 25. This may be uh, outside of the the promise of pouring out the Holy Spirit. This is probably the most, uh, second most well-known passage in Joel. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. All four of them, he put them out by name and said, I'm going to restore what they've eaten. Sometimes we feel like the things we've done were so bad, we've, we've just wrecked our life, we've ruined our life, we're never gonna get it back. That's a lie from Satan. He will restore what was destroyed. He will restore what was eaten. He will restore what the enemy has taken away. He will restore what you have lost in sin and foolishness or however it happened. It doesn't matter. He says he will restore the years the locusts have eaten. That's a promise from God. He said he will do that. And you can hold God to his promises. He will fix all of those things and make them right. But he, you know, he could just forgive and restore everything that you had and then leave you the way you were. He could do that. And that would still be wonderful that he doesn't leave us in our sin, but he doesn't just forgive us and, and restore. He goes above and beyond. This is, this is absolutely the best part of Joel's letter. In chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he speaks of this. He says, it will come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had always come on people and empowered them. But it was only for a select few. Prophets, priests, kings, people like that, some of the judges. If you were just an average person in the covenant community, you weren't getting the Holy Spirit to empower you like that. It wasn't going to happen. But God promised that a day would come when he would pour out his spirit on all of his people. Do you know when that started to be fulfilled? On the day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended to heaven, we read about it in Acts chapter 2. He poured out the Spirit. They're all baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's amazing signs that follow with it. And and Peter stands up and preaches the first, uh, you could call it the first Christian sermon, if you will, the first time he's proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah to the Jews after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he says, this is what the prophet Joel wrote about, that in those days I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And that's the beginning of it. You know, he gave, Peter quoted the whole thing about the blood, the fire, the smoke, and all that stuff. And that never happened on the day of Pentecost. Did you notice that? Did you ever wonder what that has to do with the day of Pentecost and why he kept going when he quoted Joel all the way to there? Because most prophecies uh, are, are progressive. They have an initial fulfillment and then they have a final fulfillment. Um, the Old Testament stuff in Jesus, many of them, the final fulfillment will be in the, the second coming when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth and sets up eternity to reign. But this, it, it began to be fulfilled on Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. But the the people of Jerusalem, by and large, did they all repent? No. By and large, they didn't. Do you know what happened a few years later? About 35 to 40 years later, the Romans came in and completely wiped Jerusalem off the map. Destroyed the temple, burnt it down, just like Jesus prophesied the destruction of it. That was the blood and fire and columns of smoke that Peter was referencing. If you don't repent, that greater judgment is still there waiting. It's still lurking because God's holy and he deals with sin. And just as it began to be fulfilled, the the promise, the warning, all of it began to be fulfilled in that generation. Just like Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until these things happen. It happened. And it's still being fulfilled. That judgment, the day of the Lord, it still awaits. But the day of the Lord for us is a time of joy and peace and rejoicing and blessing and excitement 
And that day is still there for us as well. So I want to challenge you. Evaluate your heart. Evaluate your life and return to the Lord in repentance. Because if we don't, there's real judgment that's coming. We can't treat sin lightly. But if we do, he's promised to bless us, to forgive us, to restore everything that's been damaged, and to go above and beyond in what he pours out on his people. 